Azura Striker Gunvolt is a platforming game a lot like Mega Man and even created by the same creator as Mega Man, Keiji, and Afude. And while there's this whole spiel of stuff with him leaving Capcom to create Mighty No. 9, Azura Striker Gunvolt has a much better reputation than Mighty No. 9, so in this video, we're going to be taking a look for ourselves to see if Azura Striker Gunvolt deserves to be compared to the likes of Mega Man. You know, unlike... unlike Mighty No. 9. Before we start, I do want to bring up something important about this video. If you're unaware, one of the most active members in the community on this channel is the homie Exit. Exit has been a huge supporter of the channel for years and has been requesting for me to review Gunvolt also for years. So now that the end of 2020 is about to come, I think it's finally time to play Azura Striker Gunvolt. So go check out Exit, everybody. His Twitter and YouTube are in the description. And if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to tell him thank you because this video would not have happened if it wasn't for Exit. So when I first opened up the game to start playing, I actually began to get worried. The number one thing that bothered me throughout this whole game is the fact that A and B are swapped in the menus. By that I mean B is select and A is go back. I know that might not sound like a huge deal, but like humanity has established that video games should make the B button be back. I mean, come on, B is for back, it's that simple. Also, they kind of just grab you by the balls for the beginning of the story and just throw you in there. Maybe I accidentally skipped some stuff at the beginning, but it's kind of hard to follow and they don't really tell you anything. On top of that, there are a lot of things in this game I wish they did tell you that they just don't. For example, the fact that there's a sprint button instead of having to double tap a direction to sprint every single time, because uh, I didn't find that out until the final boss. I also wish I knew that you could press start to skip the story cutscenes since they literally never tell you that at any point in the game nor do any other buttons do anything. The Game Boy Advance type graphics are also kind of cool for the most part but it's a little weirdly incorporated into the game. Like I understand it's a stylistic choice of course but it's kind of jarring to see text higher quality than the character busts next to it. Also the graphic design for these scenes I feel is a little bit too simple but this is just nitpicking at this point. Maybe I'm stupid but I also wish they explained how the end game mechanics worked at any point. I haven't ever played the Mega Man Zero or the Mega Man ZX game, so if any of this is from there, just give me a break, please. But basically, you have a pistol that shoots small damage shots that mark whatever you're shooting. Your mark can get upgraded twice by shooting it more, and what this mark does is make it so where your other attack does damage. Each upgrade on the mark increases the damage output of your second attack. Your second attack, by the way, is this orb of electricity surrounding you, which is really unique for a weapon, but I think it's implemented really well into the game. At first, First, I didn't like this because I knew it was just supposed to be like Mega Man and I didn't fully understand how the second attack worked so I just went pistol only for pretty much the first couple of levels which of course wasn't very fun. So now that we've gotten my initial confusion and nitpicks out of the way, it's time for me to let all of you know that I actually really did enjoy this game, especially the more I played it. One of the reasons I ended up enjoying this game so much is because yes, it is a lot similar to Mega Man. You have your starting stage, after that you have some extra bosses to choose from, an extra bonus stage, and then your Wily stages, or uh, final stages I guess. You also get to choose what order you fight the bosses in of course, but this game brings a lot of unique things to this style of gameplay which I think benefited a lot. Of course, with your second attack, there's a new mechanic which is just pretty much balancing the ammo for it I guess. Kinda like mana I guess, but when it runs out it does come back automatically. There's also an ability you start with where as long as you have extra mana, you won't take any damage. This is an equipable item though, which you can replace with other stuff later. Unlike in the Mega Man X games where you find a piece of upgrade for your armor to permanently put on, Azura Striker Gunvolt takes the Minecraft approach where you have an inventory of stuff to put on and take off as you choose, along with being able to craft stuff with the right materials as well. Oh wait, I mean uh, synth things with the right material, my bad. At the end of every level, you get some random items and you can get some in-game currency too, which are used in unison to get more parts. Unless I'm missing something, the currency seems pointless though. By the time I was able to synth my first item from finally having the right crafting materials, I already had like 50 times the amount of coins I needed for the most expensive thing, which kind of makes the coins pointless, since they aren't used for anything else. If you could use some of your coins to buy some of the crafting items, then I think this will be implemented perfectly. In this game, there is also a level up system though, where you unlock more skills and HP as you level up. You get XP from killing enemies, and I think something similar to this is in one of the Mega Man Zero or ZX games, but again, I've never played them, so put your commenting fingers away, soldier. I do wish there was an upgrade system with your levels, where you could add a skill point to your health or attack or something, but the way it works now is still great and makes grinding through enemies a lot less boring since there's an added incentive. Another ability you have are your skills, which do different powerful things. These are like final smashes from Smash Bros, and you unlock more of them by leveling up. 
They're useful, but don't really need to be elaborated on. One of the most interesting features in the game, and the one that probably saved me the most, is Lumen, who revives you after death. Only sometimes, though. So sometimes, when you die, you come back to life, but with superpowers. This is another thing I wish was explained to you in the game since I didn't fully understand this until I was yet again at the final boss, but it's still a really cool feature. Not only do you have infinite mana for your second attack, but you can also dash midair, have infinite jumps, and it plays anime music in the background. At first, I thought this happened every time you press X after dying, but apparently it's literally just random, so uh, that's, that's kind of weird. You can increase your chances of this happening though by talking to Jewel or... Joel or Julie? Look, there's no voice acting in this game, so don't get mad at my pronunciations, okay? They show you saving her at the beginning of the game, and you can have little conversations with her between missions that apparently increase the chances of you being revived later. There is also a hidden jewel in each level that you can hand to Julie, which has to do with the final ending of the game, but like, usually the discussion for the ending or the final ending of a game is saved until near the end of a video, so I'm going to continue that tradition. Now that you guys hopefully have a basic understanding of how is Zero Striker Gumbo works, it's time to take a look at the gameplay and the things that you need to play the game to know about. Because that's what I did. I played the game. Alright, so is the game fun? Well, yes it is. The combat is very unique in itself, which already makes the game at least a little fun, but all the other successfully implemented things from Mega Man and other great platforming games ties it together really well. One interesting thing I did notice though is that a lot of the levels are designed for you to be able to skip through basically every single enemy if you wanted to, which was a huge help when I had to go back and get some of those jewels I missed. Again, I think this makes the level up system even better since it's optional to kill most enemies anyway, but in doing so you could level up to a much higher level than what you would get to otherwise. I do gotta say though, the charge shot from Mega Man X can't be beat. The pistol is cool and the electric ball thing is even cooler, but being able to not only speedrun the level but also kill all the enemies in one hit from charge shots really adds a level of satisfaction that I didn't even notice until I was unable to do that in this game. Of course, in this game there are other cool strategies and things to do, I'm not trying to say it isn't cool, but like, we're comparing this to one of the greatest platforming games of all time, so we can't expect it to hit every single mark. There were also some things pretty much ripped straight out of Mega Man X. My favorite example being these weird dimensional portals that act just like the ones in Cyber Peacock stage for Mega Man X4. The music also reminds me of the modern era of Mega Man releases, also known as the 90s where all the PlayStation games were starting to come out. Mega Man X4 through 6, Mega Man 8, and even more notably, a lot of the Mega Man NT games have very similar vibes in their soundtracks that I'm sure you'll be able to pick up on from listening to the soundtrack if you're a big Mega Man fan. That being said though, I do enjoy the soundtrack, so this is not a complaint. A complaint that I do have though is that the wall jumping is much worse than in Mega Man X. Granted, you don't need to wall jump nearly as much or really even at all, but anytime you do try, you're gonna have a much harder time than you would have thought. The individual robot master stages, or uh, whatever they're called in this game, all have their own unique and memorable styles to them, which is always going to be challenging in platforming games. The use of color for their designs is obviously very well done, but I also enjoy how that color is incorporated into the level in a more subtle way. One thing I did find weird about some of the dialogue though is that number one they do cuss a little and like whoa 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 that's only for Mega Man X3 where Mega Man was faced with certain death but that aside they also like to pretend that they don't cuss by saying things like I can't see jit and holy jit which like doesn't really leave much to the imagination to say the least they also say gack with us which is just funny but if you're gonna curse in your game I don't understand the point of these goofy lines they just have to say also a lot of these characters personalities are just middle schoolers OCs but since this game is really fun to play along with the story not really mattering too much we can give them a pass but now it's time to fulfill my promise about talking about the final boss so if you're a baby a Yoshi main or just afraid of spoilers then I think it's time you go watch another Tutor P video because you've gotten about everything you can out of this one. Like I said earlier, once you defeat the six bosses and uh, this dude, then you go to the Sigma stages where the last one contains the final boss battle. I'm just gonna go ahead and let you all know, this boss battle is straight up eight. I think I spent maybe three hours total on the entire game other than the boss battle while I was taking my time and stuff, you know. And I think I spent an additional two hours just going against the final bosses. Again, this is partially due to me not finding out about how some of the detrimental parts of the game were meant to function, but I ended up getting by just fine, so I feel like these complaints are just. So the first phase of the boss fight is this dude who has a robot version of your revival thing with him, giving him a shield which can only be broken with your mana attack. Once you hit him with your electricity ball, you gotta shoot him and then continue to use your electricity on him until he runs away or you can't anymore. 
This seems fine in theory, and really the idea isn't too bad, but it's really frustrating because the shield constantly comes back up, and trying to remember the required order of attacking with your electrical ball and bullets while dodging all of its attacks is stroke-inducing. But whatever, this fight in itself isn't too bad. But there's a second phase with no healing in between. In the second phase, he turns into this giant monster, and the first five times I fought this boss, I didn't even know how to do damage, because guess what? It doesn't tell you. What you have to do is shoot both robots things with bullets, his chest ball with an electric ball, then his chest ball with bullets. And if his chest ball along with both robot things are tagged with your bullets, then you can chalk all three of them at once with your electric ball and do damage. This is another battle that isn't too hard in theory, but the fact that you're still on the same health bar as the last fight is really annoying. The second phase, once you start to get the hang of it, starts throwing a curveball at you once it gets on its last third of its health by spawning in a ceiling that one hit kills you. Because everyone loves multiple phase boss battles with attacks that one hit kills Kill you, right? Right? After dying there for hours, it's where I eventually looked up how the revive thing worked and found out it was RNG, only for me to end up beating it without even needing to be revived. Which is weird since I couldn't beat it with the revive a single time. But once I beat it, I found out that I had to get all the jewels and beat it again with a necklace on. So that's what I did. After another hour of fighting that boss, but with the necklace this time, I now get to fight the real final boss who is really dumb. You get no revives in this fight, but you do get all the powers like infinite jumps and infinite electricity balls, which is nice, but honestly you really need it for this fight. The way the fight works is the dude shoots purple balls at you which disable you from using your electricity. After the boss attacks for a while, he brings his own electricity ball and you need to collide the balls, which you can't do if you're disabled. So you have to dodge all of his attacks, attack with balls, then shock him until he lets you do it again. There are three phases to this and it is super A's to deal with since pretty much no matter where in the fight you are, if you get hit once, you're just screwed. I'm not even going to get into how hard it is to deal with some of these stupid attacks since I mean that kind of thing never translates well to YouTube videos, but once you beat this guy, you luckily beat the game. The credits play after this and they do the first time you beat the game as well and they're unskippable. They're like literally 10 minutes long and since I had already had to wait through them the first time, I assumed that you'd be able to skip them, but no, you can't. I was in disbelief though, so I spammed my keyboard during the credits, only to find out that pressing escape immediately closes the game without saving progress. Well, despite me possibly never opening the game for myself again, I still really enjoyed the game and think it's a great platforming game. And while it's not as good as like some of the best Mega Man X games, it's better than Mega Man X 6 for sure, and Capcom's been neglecting Mega Man X and Mega Man in general like I do my house chores. So if you've never played a Zero Strike or Gun Vault, I highly recommend you play it because it's really fun, even if you're not a Mega Man fan, like me.